Brilliant. <laughs> um, okay, so I guess I'll start off um, by kind of by saying, you know, it's not so much that like we're living in unprecedented times per se, but there is definitely something different to be accounted for. And whether that difference is simply that we happen to be alive in these particular times, that we exist in these times, and we neither lived in prior times nor will we in future times, I think there's definitely still a need, a reckoning, as it were, to tease out what the nature of this difference is. And I start on this note because there are always similar conversations happening regarding how we analyse technology, for example. We can talk about how technology reifies social beliefs and values. We can even go so far as to talk about how it not only imbibes, but exacerbates these very same social beliefs and values. But there is no escaping that technology still changes and brings about a change. There is clearly something new it's doing, and that needs to be reckoned with. It needs to be clearly elucidated and not only implied, but evident from any understanding of technology as an expression of the way things are. So sure, whilst we can talk a good talk about how technology simply reifies what, what we believe in a communal sense, we kind of also need to be clear that it is possible, it does in fact bring about new things and it can be a site of novelty. And I think this is where the framework of the speculative can definitely be of some value. So now before I continue, I want to say like a huge thank you to the organisers. Um, this conference has been absolutely amazing so far. I've kind of been, um, was listening to most of it yesterday and dropping in and out um, of it today. I think the panels have been absolutely fascinating um, and I'm, I feel very privileged to be able to give a keynote here. And I think I really want to also congratulate the organisers and moderators because I think we've, this has been a really great global space with really interesting and critical conversations that have been had in quite a, ni a nice and encouraging environment, which I very much appreciate. So I kind of drawing back to one of the, to, I think it was the, it was the first panel actually about translation in science fiction. Um, you know, it was already discussed how the speculative can be something much broader. It can be explanatory, it can be wistful as well as prophetic. It can be transmitted via multiple media and incorporate various genres. What I hope to contribute with this keynote is the, how the question of innovation, like where it stems from, what impacts it, might also further encourage a broader configuration of what speculative fiction is. So in a sense, what this is all about is me saying, yes, speculative fiction is definitely broad. And how broad is it really? Um, and what good and exciting things can come out of that? So as I mentioned earlier, one of the common frameworks of analysing technology is that it is a reification of the contemporary in much the same way that speculative fiction is. There is a danger of falling for the more simplistic, deterministic notions about technological development being the force that drives social change, because I think we end up losing clarity as to the difference between a marker of social change and a driver of it. I think it also means falling for a linear view of technological development rather than a more complex evolutionary one driven by multiple environmental factors. However, bearing in mind the historical um, de meaning of determinism as something that shapes, limits, fixes, and decides, I think what a linear, more determinist view of tech can aid with is being honest and confronting ourselves with the way that tech can shape our ways of existing and it can create futures while simultaneously being in the present. And I think in a similar way, for all that it can be modelled as an allegory or an exaggeration or inquiry into our present condition, speculative fiction still brings about the new. So it still brings about new configurations of social norms and values as much as it can be seen as, a, as an expression of the contemporary. So what then is the relationship um, between the now and the potential nows, the dreams of the future and its realisation? So of particular interest to me in light of this question are eras that intentionally self-describe themselves as times of innovation and change. Because this is slightly different to, you know, to, to er eras where like there might be a common perception of eras as either, you know, potentially very futuristic and kind of eras of change or those that we would typically castigate as backward or stunted, which actually were sites of significant progress. Eras that actually saw themselves as realizers of the new in the context of their time, I think are rich for investigation through the frameworks of both critical technology and narrative analysis. And also because ultimately, who doesn't like a bit of irony, 
The, ar the arrival of the modern age is resonant for this reason, because not only did it bring about the conditions we currently live in, they were, from the writings of the natural philosophers, theologians, politicians, scientists, inventors, intriguingly conscious of it. So this similarity with our era of late stage capitalism, as well as the fact that these were often periods of widened social inequality and restriction of the commons, even though self-described as times of momentous progressive change, makes it all too tempting to resist. So if we've settled on a time, on what place? Well, if a time is to be decided based on this notion of self-knowledge, the place can be as well. With regards to this era of West European, Western European expansion and colonization, to quote David Arnold, the concept of Europe and Europeans was shaped in relation to the extra European world. Um, and as Catherine Hall says, um, it's, it's quite remarkable how in the British context in particular, the colonies provided the, the benchmark, which allowed the English to determine what they did not want to be and who they were. To take one simple illustration um, that she provides, the term European was widely employed by British people outside the continent to describe people who were seen to share a common origin and identity, regardless of their national affiliations and in contradistinction to other races and, and cultures. And that's really interesting because, you know, actually within the European context, the, the so-called European national might be very, very clear about the differences between, say, North and South Italians, or the fact that in the UK, there's still very, Scotland is very different from England and Ireland. But actually, when it comes to relating with the non-European, this was this remained kind of like this unifying um, identifier. Thus, we have our time and place. Early modern era and the colonies as the perhaps unwitting identifiers actually of the metropole and of the metropolitan fiction, as I might call it, in a time with its own narrative as one of particularly acute progress in the spheres of philosophy, technology and finance. But in particular, the sugar colonies also as sites of technological imperialism, violence and innovation, because all of these feed into and are part of each other. And also their sites of, re of realization of kind of a pre-modernist futurism, providing as they did a playground for new dreams that simply did not and could not exist in the metropole. And we see this again to quote Arnold in the way that colonies and their successor states provided career openings for well-qualified women as well as men, opportunities that were often lacking or very restricted in Europe. So one of the first ways we encounter the colony uh, is through the map. Jamaica, which I will, be, I will always be coming back to throughout this talk, was wrested from the Spanish in 1655. Uh, and so the first function of the map as a narrative of political conquest and national kudos becomes very evident. Um, so when we look at these maps from a critical perspective, it's notable what's missing. So uh, Charlton Yingling talks about how on these maps, what we actually see are it's actually more maps of omission and silences. So in the background, um, it's kind of taken from, uh, from an online archive. Um, and in this case, it's the map of the island of Barbados. And all of the little settlements that you see um, are all um, European um, colonial settlements, even though this was a time where there were still indigenous encampments, um, encampments of Africans, so whether those who, who um, were like runaway or like freed enslaved people, the, this reality is not represented on, 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 on this technology, I suppose, the, the technology of the map. Yingling also goes on to show how um, you know, even though these maps are themselves quite barren of the presence of the enslaved and of the oppressed, that's not to say that they're not rich with data, but it's, again, it's the kind of data which is noteworthy and the narratives, the fictions they choose to tell. So, for example, he talks about there's, you know, striking British maps which show, like, views of the coastlines of Montserrat from the sea. Um, with towns and ports marked by detailed buildings like windmills. And there's extraordinary amounts of detail, including mythological creatures such as like a fawn playing a pan lute, mermaids holding the flags of England, Ireland and Wales, um, and so on. And there are even every now, and then, every now and again, you might see very crude attempts at depicting indigenous people. However, these examples are outliers and not the norm. 
um, as Yingling says, it's actually more common to omit mention of the enslaved or to couch them in terms of cultivation of labor intensive crops such as sugar or resource extraction like salt pans, silver mines or logwood clearing. So if these maps can be read as both technology and fiction, I think this gives, starts to give us a clue regarding the underlying futurisms such fictions were meant to represent. As we hone in on our view of the plantation, uh, we, we continually find kind of these sort of different, like almost like geological strata of fictions. Um, by the time of the early 18th century, every Jamaican plantation would have been connected to the sea. And this process was, of course, way underway um, from the 1650s when the British took control. And that in itself was based on an already existing uh, Spanish network. Hayden Bassett talks about how um, what we see with these actually are highly socialized infrastructure of control um, that mediated the movement of enslaved and other subjugated people beyond and between plantation boundaries. And this is particularly fascinating because they also note, for example, that road segments could equally navigate terrain that concealed certain aspects of the plantation system to abolitionist writers, government officials, tax collectors, missionaries, and other traveling spectators. And in some cases, and this is from a, a direct quote from a primary source, with no other apparent view but to excite the attention of the traveler. Um, so it's a bit of a reach perhaps, but I feel this insight into the way that the plantation islands, even the very infrastructure was built both as a mean of surveillance, but also whimsy. It kind of reminds me a lot of um, one, yeah, a particular film that I'm quite fond of, um, Brazil, um, which was kind of um, released in 1985. And it's something about the way, you know, when I think about this movie, I often think about how the set design speaks both of concealment and surveillance at the same time. And I think this is something that comes across in the in the description of like the built infrastructure of the plantation islands they are similar to they are simultaneously sites of um concealment from the plantation owners um but also ways of surveilling and controlling um the people who on upon whose labor um they they essentially operate and in fact, even, even more so that the resistance movements, such as the Maroons, you know, who made really clever use of the simultaneous concealed visibility of the road system in their guerrilla warfare against the plantation class. So although created as part, so in this particular case, in the background, you can see uh, this map um, of the Albion estate um, uh, of the, yeah, which is on the, on Jamaica, part, well, that was in Jamaica. Um, now, slightly yeah sorry the software slightly messed up but actually like you know it's really interesting how the geometric perfection of this map really resonates actually again with Bassett's earlier point about the nature of map of silences in maps because if we were to see this you know in the front pages of a fantasy book we would absolutely mock it and rightly so like it's it's barely a map it barely tells you anything about the world that the writer supposedly setting the story in Yet in the framing of the colonial narrative, this is an idealized view, one without reference to its workers' realities, their living spaces, their very existence. And as this, this map is actually much later, so it's made in 1889, so it's not, it's not of course, from the modern era that I'm particularly analyzing. But nonetheless, it kind of shows how by this point in time, the idealized view of the plantation had been firmly established, firmly reified, and we see this through other even slightly earlier works, like in the 18th century, you have people like Samuel Martin, who's like a planter in Antigua, talking about how a properly managed plantation ought to be considered as a well-constructed machine, compounded of various wheels, turning different ways, and yet all contributing to the great end proposed. That great end being what? So I guess at this point, you know, as we're kind of honing in on the the this, the plant the, the early modernist colony, you know, there's something about how actually these in themselves these fictions are revealing something about, in a sense, the world building of the plantation class, of the colonial class, of the imperial imperialist project. So when we consider that many Jamaican plantations, for example, were designed to both keep the enslaved at greatest distance and yet under constant surveillance, as the fear of escape and uprising was very real and justified, it is worth asking ourselves what kind of futurity is being presented here? What, is, what kind of futurity is this meant to represent? 
People want to make money, but they don't want to see how it's made. They want to live the life of royalty in the lands that, they, that they've left, but they don't want to encounter those who make it possible. Like what split consciousness is at the heart of all of this? And how deep does the split consciousness go? Even when we get to the level of the plantation workings itself, we see the same curious elision. The enslaved are rarely depicted in the numbers that they would actually have existed in, nor even really at the intricate kind of work they would have been doing. When one looks at engravings and images of the colonial industrial complex, the thing that stands out most is that in the midst of this choreography of death are the Mecca. The enslaved are but occasional and usually poised detail. And when we encounter attitudes from plantation owners who thoroughly saw their enslaved workers as machinery, for example, through the accounts of inventors such as Baron Albert von Stack, or the infamous plantation inventories that number the enslaved by color specialism alongside cattle engines and wrenches, all of this provides an additional dimension. The enslaved are not only vanished, they are vanished as they are the Mecca themselves. This also occurs in common public perceptions, actually, at the time of the kind of the great sugar rush, as it were, or the or, um, kind of great sugar capitalism. And this is um, and as something that in itself is kind of quite wondrous. That's the result of like mechanical wizardry. Um, there's a, a historian and critic, Johnny Crowley, has a really great way of putting it. He says that sugar fascinated many early Euro modern Europeans because machines made it and they loved machines. Early modern visual representations of sugar plantation privileged machinery over people. This privileging largely took the work of slaves for granted and, intentionally or not, deflected attention from slavery. When the threat of abolition loomed, even anti-abolitionist patrons supported artists who naturalized the plantation regime by representing sugar's technology and its enslaved peoples in picturesque style. So here, this idea of the plantation as machine and the enslaved as non-separate components of a larger machine complex all combine to emphasize what Arnold has called the vanishing um, effect of automata. It's worth noting that this idea of the plantation can be seen in disparities or depictions of labor in 16th century art, for example, where according to Crowley, we see the association of sugar production with the industrial, but not the agricultural. And here we're seeing another form of vanishing. Uh, Crowley goes on to say that in view of the labor, discipline, and organization of work, the interchangeability of labor units, time consciousness owing to the crop's rapid perishability, during the modern, during the early modern period, um, sugar manufacture was the most industrialized form of human enterprise, and there was great pride taken in the technological progress embodied in the sugar plantation. However, which carried dire humanistic implications because obviously it implicitly rationalized slavery and the Atlantic African slave trade as necessary factors of modernization. That sugar plantations were sites of technological innovation also emphasizes this vanishing. So from the earlier Spanish colonies, we see that improvements were made to increase efficiency and ultimately profit. So for example, new cylinder mills of the 16th century being invented to reduce the labor required. So you don't need to keep like chopping up canes into small, small pieces before putting them into the grinder and all that, all that kind of additional labor. However, you know, these innovations were, were either done in eras that, where there was still enough indigenous and then later African enslaved labor, or in eras where enslaved labor was the dominant workforce. So particularly thinking about Hispanic colonies in Cuba, but this is still very much the case for British colonies too. So clearly this innovation is not done for the philanthropic benefit of the enslaved population, indigenous or African. None of this has any impact on the numbers of captured Africans being required. None of this has any impact on the genocide or the diminishing population of the indigenous peoples. And I would argue this is because the futurity that's wanted is actually one of vanishing. It's a world where action at a distance is realized. And that, last, and that whole thing about action at a distance, I'll go into a bit later. But fundamental to this and what these innovations are revealing and what this built reality, these built fictions are telling us is that this isn't so much about um, this, th that the, the, at the heart of this is this vanishing. It is, in a, it is in some cases outright genocide, which is what is being driven at. And again, you know, these are again some other examples where, you know, you're seeing um, 
indigenous or African enslaved people kind of working using um, technologies. But again, they're all, <laughs> they're all very staged. I mean, the one on the bottom left carrying bundles of firewood almost looks like they're posing um, for a magazine or something. And, but ultimately what this is kind of all leading, leading towards, this kind of this lack of, repre of true representation, um, even in, as I mentioned, even in the abolitionist um, literature, it points towards the fact that this is, it's marking a particular type of futurism, a particular type of reality that people want to exist. It's not a mark of, of benevolence, not in the least. As we examine the technology used in the English sugar colonies, what else is being reconfigured? as the medieval automata that once established times of prayer is turned horizontal to transmit the labor of the enslaved into crushing cane. How else is time being transformed and why? Perhaps in the physical realignment of this over-familiar hardware, we see a harbinger or even an exemplifier of the paradigm shift. If, to paraphrase Arnold, the Enlightenment android embodied through their tricks and a material and cultural fetish around autonomy, then is it also an attempt to realize the fiction that the early modern cyborg in the form of the enslaved person expressed? One of the most famous and impactful examples of speculative fiction at the cusp of English colonialism is Thomas More's Utopia. Published in 1516, part satire, part thought experiment, the work can be seen as a kind of narrative proposal for an ideal commonwealth. We also see within the text, as well as all the kind of the great discussions about kind of freedom of religion and philosophical debates, we also see an example of vanishing in the form of the genocide and assimilation of the indigenous Abraxan people, which was foundational to the utopians progressive technologically capable society. So they existed on this particular island first, and again, through, well, basically were wiped out um, by the settler utopians. Now there's plenty to, to discuss and debate which parts of the work are satirical and which parts are visionary, but its impact can't be denied as highlighted by Carl Hardy in, in, in their work, Unsettling Hope, Settler Colonialism and Utopianism. America, initially at least, could only too readily be seen as the actual embodiment of the Renaissance utopia. For many early explorers and administrators, Moore's utopia acquired the status of a guide and handbook. With its aid, Vaco de um, Quiroga drew up a scheme for the government of New Spain, for example. The leader of the first English colonial expedition, Sir Humphrey Gilbert, carried a, book of Moore, carried a copy of Moore's book along with him in 1583. And the first English settlements began with a system of common ownership on utopian lines. And they go on to say how between 1516 and 1750, 25 Latin editions of Utopia appeared, but this figure scarcely amounts for the popularity of the utopian idea, and that is utopian with a capital U, i.e. directly derived from this work that Moore had written. In the same period, translations multiplied, 10 into English, seven into French, six into Dutch, three into German, with one each into Spanish and Italian. And actually, um, other um, digital humanists like Gibson have traced like around over 200 works, which are imitations or parodies, or contain some allusion to this foundational piece of speculative fiction. And there are really interesting parallels as well between how the utopians live a life of mutual hospitality um, and kind of and you know and fine manners, even though this has been built on the indigenous on the genocide of the indigenous Abraxans. And you can see this parallel between that and the fine life enjoyed by many plantation owners in the Caribbean who developed um, again, a very sophisticated kind of manners-based culture that put an enormous emphasis on hospitality and generosity to members of their class, or to take again a term from Utopia, those with whom they shared a kinship of nature, not unlike plantation culture of the American Deep South or oligarchical cultures in Colombia and Venezuela. Again, to be a bit naughty, I couldn't help but be reminded of this still from Brazil, from the movie Brazil, where in the edifice of the architecture of a morally depraved society weaves in and amongst the presence of privileged diners. This visual intrusion of the brutalist into the space of the privileged being very obvious to us as viewers and yet completely unnoticed to the majority of the diners. 
Much as I've been struck by Arnold's essay on the vanishing and automata and the way that by their existence, the automata are involved in this work of the vanishing of human labor, of human effort, of human existence. I think I was as much struck due to a clear association, to me anyway, between the vanishing we see represented in the sugar plantation mecca and also this idea foundational um, to, to colonialist science of, of action at a distance. This was a fundamental theory which dealt with the physics of interaction that does not involve direct or indirect contact um, between bodies. The assumption was that action could be communicated between bodies by means other than by physical contact, and this must therefore involve some supposed immaterial reality. Such a model of the universe was espoused by a range of scientists, including Newton. One of the modern philosophers of science um, who really ran with this idea was Francis Bacon. And he wrote extensively on the subject in some of his um, treatises, like in his 1609 on the wisdom of beasts. And I think it's really interesting that someone whose fundamental understanding of reality is based on the idea of separating forces from bodies that transmit was also key to elucidating a narrative of human progress entwined with that of the exploitation and domination of nature. Both require, in a sense, a vanishing of the intermediate, a subconscious dissolution of the ties that bind us to nature and each other. This vanishing can also be seen in the dualism that enabled, actually and still enables, much of our current mathematical analysis and modeling. So to quote Serpil um, Operman um, in her paper, Ecological Imperialism in British Colonial Fiction, in Bacon's epistemology, human beings are promoted as agents of imperialism and nature as mere commodity. The driving force of science itself was the Cartesian dualism of mind and matter, which opened the path to the idea and practice of ultimate dominion over and control of natural bodies by the superior human agency, and inadvertently to the process of colonization itself. For all that he might personally have been more of an Aristotelian bent, in many ways Moore's utopia is also defined by this kind of moral action at a distance, an example of what we might call early egocentric ethics to take, a, to take the coinage from Carolyn Merchant and her work in uh, radical ecology. How a people can be called progr progressive whilst the foundations of their society is one of genocide and theft actions that they themselves consider inherent wrongs is a narrative born of deeper understandings that certain actions and their results do not need to be considered as transmissible. Now, to what extent Moore himself held this view, I suspect, I suspect probably also decides to what extent utopia can be considered satire or not. Nonetheless, considering that Bacon was writing around 90 years after Moore and the plantation system was already in, well entrenched by Moore's time, if we want to frame in terms of in terms of continuity, which obviously I want to do, the vanishing that we're seeing, justified by the fictive and the capacity of the mechanical for generating profit, literally at a distance, feed into, mutually support and exacerbate each other. Demonstrating, but perhaps not fully explaining, the links between speculation, innovation, rarefication and invention. At each layer of the plantation, we see a coinciding with these layers in the construction of the utopian, again, capital U, futurist narrative. Rather, not so much a narrative, rather, I would argue, I would argue, sorry, I would argue a narrative rather than an actual futurity. And I make that differentiation because if the aspiration is one of a world where action at a distance is made possible, so not just in the realm of nature, as those like Bacon surmised, um, and theorized, but a power which European humanity could wield for itself, I would argue what we are seeing, um, what we are seeing actually um, is a futurist narrative and the hardware technology, as well as its you know, resultant software offspring, is actually an attempt to reflect and embellish upon that narrative, to continue tell, telling that story. Because the reality is that ultimately, there never was any action at a distance. There was always a material that transmitted action into force, and that material was the existence of indigenous and black people. And so in that sense, the technological setup of the sugar plantation was theater design of a most depraved and horrific sort, but theater nonetheless. So what I've kind of found sort of 
taking this line of thought when I'm thinking about like the ways technology becomes is innovated upon and how it impacts society and also how speculative narratives do can do the same and indeed are, are deeply entangled with uh, with the technolo- technological what i found is that um, by expanding the idea of speculative fiction to include you no know, design and construction actually it helps me have a better understanding of different kinds of futurism and in the same way we judge literary and cinematic works by the verisimilitude of their world building, this framing can also help us judge when what we are seeing is in itself a fiction, even when expressed through the materiality of iron and stone. Thank you.